Well, good morning to you all. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to Philippians 4. Our focus will be 4 through 7 this morning. Um, you notice it's not judges, uh, and that, there's a reason for this. Um, as a lot of us in this church family, that's grieving various things. Um, even now, I imagine entering this place or even logging on online singing these hymns. Uh, many of you are on the brink of coming undone. Um, and I, I've learned that grief is one of those things that um, we wander around this earth and we find no cure. And we say silly things like, you know, um, time heals all wounds and it doesn't. It just kind of numbs it. You live with something, there's something that reminds you of it, and grief comes back. Um, and, and, and we live in a world where death seems victorious. Uh, it's taking loved ones from us. It's an increasingly hostile, hate-filled world that makes daily life, even our workplaces and family gatherings, simply a place of, uh, of heated sorrow. And uh, such sorrow, anxiety, stress, and weeping is shared amongst us, where friends and family may betray us. We listen and care for one another in Christ, meaning grief strikes all of us when it strikes one of us. Um, so that, that's why Pastor Steve and I were, we thought it wise to take a break from judges to consider God's joyful peace for the downcast soul. And honestly, when we were deciding to take this break a while, a couple, you know, a week and a half or so ago, um, we did not see uh, on the horizon, um, you know, national powers uh, and, and, and things going on overseas that could cause even further anxiety. So I think it's it's actually quite um, irrelevant when we come to Scripture and what it shows us. So um, if you find your place there, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, I'll read. This is the holy word of our God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we hear your command, and uh, we know our flesh. It is as a command that is burdensome if we are to do it on our own flesh. Heavenly Father, there are some of us who gather here and it hurts. There are some of us who gather here with frustrations that seem to find no satisfaction. Longings that seem to find no contentment. God, uh, we may not find anything here on earth, but we gather here to worship you. Lord, we, we humbly ask that you administer to each one of us and to all of us as a, as a church family as a whole. That you would draw near to us. That through your word we would hear your peace that surpasses all understanding. And Lord, uh, help us by your Holy Spirit who takes up residence in us to make sense of this passage. But even more than just um, mastering what it means, Lord, may the gravity, the weight of it be upon us. As we hear him call to come to him for rest, Lord, grant to us rest. Grant to us the rest of our wandering hearts that we would have a rest, a trusting rest in Christ. Bless us, O oh God, for your glory's sake we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that no matter what, it's in various ways, every one of us who gather in this room or in the hearing of this sermon is going through something rather hard. Um, some are going to be more difficult. Some are more frustrating than others. But it seems to be a hard season for us right now. Um, the Bible offers to us, um, as a church, good practical theology. And there some people ask, oh, uh, you know, Pastor, give us something practical. Give us something on the ground. Well, good. Here's this. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It doesn't get any more beautiful and practical than that. But we are not to just lean on each other. If we take away from that, it's like, oh, I just need to surround myself with friends. No. We are too weak to carry each other's burdens on our own. 
That's why Paul um, opens this chapter of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 1, when he says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm in the Lord. And from such a foundation is the passage that we study this morning uh, built upon. Before we can rip it out of its context and make it say something we want it to say, it needs to say what it actually says. This is what it means to stand firm on the Lord. And I catch how Paul describes this Christian community, this local church in Philippi, in Philippians 4, is addressing the entire local church family. He's not just saying individually rejoice in the Lord. He says this is a brief passage, always, nothing, everything, all. And such descriptions says something to what he means to stand firm in the Lord when he says rejoice in the Lord. Always. There should be never a time the Christian is not. There is, yeah, it's not rejoicing in the Lord. Sorry, double negatives make my head spin, and I don't know why I just did that. Um, so he says, stand firm in the Lord by rejoicing the Lord always. If we're to stand always firm in the Lord, we're rejoicing always in the Lord. But is it, is it really possible? I mean, is Paul telling us something that is just not going to be seen? Is it possible to rejoice in the Lord always? I mean, it's easy to read this verse in most of our days, right? We can even put it in our copy mugs like, today makes sense. I can rejoice today because things are going well. But days come that are too heavy and it's too dark to read it with all that much ease. There are those close to us who wound us with words that make this command to rejoice seem completely out of reach. There are hard places of great weeping. What about when it hurts too much to rejoice, Paul? I think this is where we find ourselves when we are weak. But Paul isn't saying, suck it up. He doesn't say, hey, when things get rough, suck it up. Or feel guilty when you grieve because everything is supposed to be cheery. And redefining uh, rejoicing as some sort of positive vibes and canceling negative vibes as some worldly wisdom might want you to think. Now he says rejoice in the Lord, and in the Lord is the key to understanding it. This is about belief. Belief is more than words. To say, I believe in Christ, is deeper than merely joining a club. To believe has a particular weight to it. With so, with such a thing as suffers the loss of relationships, it becomes a matter of life and death. Then our beliefs come exposed and come to the full surface. It is there, when troubles are too weighty for us, we find our belief. What we truly believe. Do we trust God? Or do we allow our downcast soul to call God's character into question? You have a confidence in Christ when you are born again. The overwhelming darkness of grief doesn't come with shouts saying to yourself, I no longer believe in God. If that was simply the temptation, you're like, well, I know I'm not going to go down that road. Rather, I think the temptations of our souls in the darkness is believing something ugly about God. The claiming his character and calling it into question. It's not that I'm going to say, oh, well, I don't believe in God anymore because this trial is too heavy. My fear is that something hard comes and you're going to start questioning, is he good? I mean, is God really good? Because loved ones die, God. Wars continue, God. Friendships still break up, God. Diseases still come, God. And I think I'm justified in my calling God's character into question. That's where I go when I'm sinning. Perhaps God doesn't listen, or perhaps his compassion has worn thin with me. God's peace is something I cannot receive here. That's joy. Can I ever have joy again? He is wrong, says my downcast soul, which is not rejoicing in the Lord and not standing firm in the Lord. So then we hear, rejoice in the Lord always. And I love the way Paul says that if you didn't hear me the first time, I'll do it again. Rejoice. As if he's hearing the audience go question, well, I wonder if he means always or if he really means rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord with your heart and mind, and they, your heart and mind will be guarded in Christ, that is, in the Lord, in his peace. We tend to think if 
severed relationships will just reconcile, or a loved one just doesn't die, then I will have peace. But peace of the downcast soul is not in the world, and not in the things that we can see and touch. The sorrowful life in this dreadfully dark world is tough for all of us. But I think it's especially tough with grief. This grief casts shadows like a walk in the woods on a moonless night. There's no earthly recovery. You just change scenery from one day to the next. And, but it's still haunting you. It's still with you. And there's a point when a downcast soul becomes so troubled and weak that the only option is to cry out to God. I have exhausted all other avenues. I've exhausted all other hopes of some sort of comfort. Now all I've got is just to cry out to God. Let your request be made known to God, Paul says. When you're there, make your requests be made known to God. It's the very same Paul who previously told us he learned how to be content, that is satisfied, whether he has a lot or nothing, whether he is free or in prison. In any circumstances, he's found the secret to be content, to be satisfied, to be filled with joy, that he's rejoiced in the Lord always. God's peace for us in Christ is a peace that surpasses understanding, he says. Or simply put, it doesn't make any earthly sense. The world's going to say, what do you you mean religion brings you peace? It's like, it's not religion, it's Christ. The downcast creature may come to God in prayer and think we can ask him a question that's too wonderful for him. Like, we inform him of something, and we caught him off guard. Or perhaps he's like, we're asking him to do something of the impossible in our life, and we think, I wonder, can God do this? As if God is either limited in wisdom or limited in power to right any wrongs. How, how then can we have joy or rejoice in the Lord always when it hurts? Well, James addresses this in his opening Um, chapter in his letter, James chapter 1, 2 through 4, when he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the lacking in nothing doesn't mean all the earthly luxuries and stuff that we think of it. But he says, He doesn't say, count it a joy. He could have. He could just say, hey, this is a grace to you. This is a joy to you that uh, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. But he says, he says, count it all joy. Kind of fits in with what Paul is saying. And all, everything, nothing, always. So it's not in some afflictions, but every single one of them, both minor and major. Just as Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always, always means even in impossible times. Afflictions are not only our own, but not knowing what to say or to do when you see a loved one go through chemo treatments or suffer deep grief or simply the daily care of someone frail and unable to care for themselves. So afflictions are not always major events. We think of them as, well, maybe afflictions are just the big things that happen in my life. And I think what Paul and James is getting at is, Most of the time, it is in our daily sorrow of selfless, exhaustive care for others. Do not grow weary in doing good. But how? Just how do you expect me to fulfill that command? Beloved, God is merciful. He provides what he commands. He doesn't just say, go get out there and suck it up and do it on your own. That's why I think Paul says pray. Uh, Pray with thanksgiving. Why? Because God gives you what you need when you, when you make your request and they made known to God who is producing steadfast in you, steadfastness in you when you're going through trials and sufferings and afflictions. Conforming you to Christ who is perfection. We're heading in that direction. That God is merciful to give the church to one another. Again, this command to rejoice in the Lord always is given to a local church body to um, obey together. So in Philippians 4 verse 10, um, Paul said he rejoiced greatly in the Lord. Same verbiage. Because of how much the Philippian church cared for him. There is great joy to be had in a church family that cares for each other in Christ. So there's rejoicing there. Back in Philippians 4 and verse 5, Paul says this. 
Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Um, the word is gentleness. Just like Paul commanded Pastor Titus in Crete that Christians are to be taught by pastors to speak evil of no one, but be peaceable and gentle. Or Paul writing to Pastor Timothy to raise up pastors who are not violent. And they're not quarrelsome, but they're, they're gentle, they're peaceable, they're reasonable. The Christian rejoicing in the Lord always is a peaceable, gentle, reasonable soul to everyone. No matter the circumstance. He's steadfast. He's fixed. Here, Paul tells us the command to let our gentleness or reasonableness be known to all. That is all people. It's easy enough until they realize what everyone actually means. He didn't say be gentle with gentle people. He didn't say be reasonable to reasonable people. He says to all. And this is where I want to take a good examination of my own flesh. Why do I want to rebel this command? Why do I want to say no to this? Why do I want to avoid this command, claim it as too burdensome for me, so God, I know that command is for others, don't you dare put on me, and why would I dare come to God trying to justify myself to not be gentle, to, to, to let my gentleness be known to everyone? Why, why would I want to? And I think, I, so I ask these questions because the same foundation to rest our heads to rejoice in the Lord always is also found in the answer to those questions. I will not count it all joy in various trials if I face these trials on whom I am to be gentle or to be defining joy on my own terms and circumstances and how I feel about things. If I say my joy is found in how I feel about things how things are going with me. My heart's going to go up and down, up and down. My gentleness is going to be up and down, up and down. My rejoicing is going to be up and down, up and down. And then who is my God in those circumstances? I am. Why am I saying, what I'm, what I'm saying is this. It is incredibly dangerous to skip over my sinfulness and still think that I can rejoice always. To think that I, don't, I have nothing to repent of. That I'm doing fine. It's the rest of the world. They're the ones who are causing me to be no longer gentle. They're the ones taking my joy. I can't rejoice in the Lord always because Jesus is too weak to hold on to me. And so I have bad days and you're just going to have to deal with it. And Paul says, no. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness at all times be known to everyone. Then he says this in verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you, there's the gospel. But you may have missed it. You may have missed it because I think it has something to do with our Western idea of reading things. Because he says, be anxious about nothing. Again, not the be anxious about very little things. He says never. Paul does not leave any room to dwell in anxiety. What is anxiety then? I think in its truest sense, anxiety exposes our fear. What I mean is this. If we fear this changing, fading world, we will be, we will be anxious of the changing tides of time. Um, if we fear the unchangeable, everlasting Christ... We will find rest for our souls with faith that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he will, keep his, he will keep his promises. There is a fear of such a great God that dissolves earthly fears. What I mean is this. There is a mercy that gives a peace that we cannot comprehend. Anxiety cannot stand before the heat of God's peace for us in the crucified and risen Savior. So with confidence, we pray to our Heavenly Father in Jesus' name. With thanksgiving, we make our requests be made known to God, whose name is hallowed. God's peace surpasses understanding, Paul says. And it's so true, peace is not achieved in careful, painful, anxious pursuit of our own figurings out. And don't you tell me, that is exactly where I find myself. So I know that I'm not alone in this room. 
And I would say that it, it is exposed greatly in grief or in trying times. I know what I need to do. I need to set myself to anxious pursuit of figuring this out. It never leads to peace. We may lie in bed trying at late at night to think of all the things that I need to accomplish. Researching everything about everything that is wrong. And if I can just get enough information, I can fix it and get it all right. You know, I have found that every time I do that, peace is never at the end of that pursuit. Just anxiety. In fact, most of the time, more anxiety. The, if you tr are trying to figure things out so that you may provide for yourself peace, you will only provide yourself with more anxiety, more stress, more grief. You will not fix it. And the Bible has a word for this. It's downcast. When my soul is downcast, things don't make sense. My peace will not be found in the lengthy pursuit of my own understanding. Nor will it be found in manipulating things around me. Nor will it be found in the temporary release of cliches like, you got this, or reach for the moon, and if you miss, at least you'll have the stars. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. No grief, sadness, sorrow that surpasses understanding requires a peace that surpasses understanding. And the peace of God is unattainable. The peace of God is unsearchable. The peace of God is unreachable. You can't chase it down. You can't contain it. You can't fulfill yourself by educating yourself more about it. It is further than the moon. It is deeper than the sea. And yet it is yours. It is yours in full in Christ. It's by simply asking. He says, come to me all who are weary. He doesn't say what kind of level of weariness you find yourself in. From minor to major, he says, come to me, all who are weary. I will give you rest. And when Jesus' rest is given to you, it is a peace that surpasses your understanding. The very same understanding you thought, well, I'll just ch chase this down with my own understanding. I'll try and figure it out. I'll wrestle it and I'll contain it. You can't. You can ask all the what if and the why questions you want. You will not fix this. The peace of God that is given to you is a peace that leads to your rejoicing the Lord always and a gentleness. Christ lets his gentle reasonables known to you always. He's always gentle with us. His peace is not of this world. His peace that surpasses understanding, he just gives to you, beloved. He loves you and he cares for you. He's so cast your burden on him, trusting in his love and care for you. Ask in prayer with a thankful heart, for God has joyful peace for your downcast soul. It's a shalom peace and the stillness before God, trusting his doings over our own figurings out. The peace of God, Paul says, guards our hearts and minds. Do, do you feel like your heart and your mind need guarding? It's a constant bombardment from the outside world. And our natural response is anxiety. Because most of the time we think, I can lean on myself. I can figure this out. I can do this and I can do that. But he doesn't just say that the peace of God guards our hearts and minds, period. It goes back to the in the Lord. He guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus that we remain faithful to him. That we are, our steadfastness is not one of just producing individual character to the praise of others. It is producing the character of Christ in us. So our hearts, our minds, naturally, they're incredibly feeble. They're untrustworthy. They're strong one day and seems weak the other. We're frail. And those who claim to be strong-minded, strong-opinionated, in all actuality are weak. They're just trying to protect themselves from any kind of serious question or serious trial. They're attempting to guard themselves in their own anxiety. So let me put a few verses together to get, gain some clarity uh, to our hurt 
as well as Christ with us through our hurt. Everyone who desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. And that promise leads to Christ's words in John, the world will give you trouble. But let not your hearts be troubled, for I have overcome the world. We're now left as orphans, he says. Do you see Christ as your refuge? A mighty strong tower, a place of rest and comfort. When the world gives you trouble, where do you go? To your own figurings out? Do you wallow in self-pity? Do you go to bitterness and anger? These are all words for anxiety. Something that we're commanded to not be, not to be anxious about anything. I think that's why the, Paul says to rejoice in the Lord. And God's peace guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Those are together. It's be in Christ. Run to him. Pray to him. Seek him. Do not pursue earthly peace trying to figure out the whys and the whats. Why something must hurt or why people must say mean things or why must I go through a trial? Peace is not found in your figurings out to make you feel better because you're not. It's actually the end of that pursuit is more anger, more anxiety, more peacelessness. Do not turn your face away from Christ to seek peace on your own terms. You leave your heart and your mind rather vulnerable to attack by a world full of troubles when you do. It leads you to anger, leads you to anxiety and frustration. Beloved, with faith. And then it's just, I say this and I plead with you with everything that is in me. My heart, my mind, my tears and prayers for the sermon and my loving care for each of your downcast souls to listen. All of the negative commands of scripture that you can think of. Do not covet. Do not bear false witness. Do not steal. Our Lord Jesus Christ repeated one negative command more than any other by far. Fear not. That is the one that our ears should perk up to. And we can spend some time on those other ones. You should not covet. You should not bear false witness. You should not steal. But far above any of those as mentioned is fear not. Fear not those who can kill the body, but who can kill the soul. Uh, who, who cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, that sounds rather discouraging. It sounds abrasive, yes. But then Jesus proceeded to tell his followers that the Father values them far above sparrows. Now the law and gospel make sense. Why do we fear things on earth? Why does my anxiety get caught up in the relationships here on earth? Why is my everything bound to the earth? Why are, are my emotions, why do, is my strength all bound to whether or not things are going well according to the way I wanted them? Because there, there seems to be, I'm just walking through a life full of ruin, death is reigning, relationships that I have forged are, can be severed in just a moment, and here I am left in pain. How can I rejoice in the Lord always? I want to turn with you, with you all in Matthew's gospel. In Jesus' words in Matthew 6, when um, he tells us to not be anxious about anything in our life, what are we going to eat, how we're going to dress. And in all of this, he says this in verse 27, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Or you know, a cubit, if you will. And then he doesn't end there. Um, and if you turn to chapter 10, verse 19, he says this to his disciples. Chapter 10, verse 19. Uh, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. These are scary things our Lord is describing. And he commands us not to be anxious or fearful of them. Death is one. Death is very scary. And we can play with the cliches. I mean, it is scary. Don't say it's just death. It's not. It's, it's over for this lifespan at that. 
And he mentions this. He says, this is a scary thing, but don't be afraid of it because what, what is your fear? What is your anxiety going to do? You're going to add moments to your life by fear? No. no that's, not, that's not rest. That's fear. You can't add to your life with such pursuits and fear and trying to figure things out. Don't be anxious of what you will say when you're finally imprisoned and must answer a wicked judge. You may say, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. Fear the one who can cast body and soul into hell, Jesus says. I know how many of you are hearing this command, be anxious about nothing, fear not. You know how I know that? Because I know that you hear it as, you better not. You can almost write it down in your Bibles. I know that's how you hear it. You better not get afraid. You better not get anxious. But that's not what it says. I imagine many of you have said this to yourselves as I preached it. Well, I just better not get afraid. I better not be anxious. You better not go through it. Stop it, soul. Stop getting anxious. Stop being fearful, O oh, downcast soul. Stop it when things hurt, that you get anxious and get confused and frustrated. If I could just calm myself down. And I will tell you that any conversation I have with someone who is anxious and says to themselves, well, I better just calm myself down. You know what the end of that pursuit is? It isn't peace. It's more anxiety. If you would permit me to shepherd you to Christ, the good shepherd, in this moment. He doesn't say his peace is given to you if you just stop being afraid, if you can just calm yourself down. I know that's how we hear it. That he helps those who help themselves. He raises dead people from the grave. He gives us a peace that is beyond your comprehension, your understanding. A peace that is not of this world and you can't achieve it is unreachable. He just gives it to you. And we think of his mercy as something achieved. It's, it's silly, but we go through the cycle. I'm anxious again. The Bible says never be anxious. And you heard, read it, you better not. As opposed to what you're supposed to do with it. And you say, well, I don't know, I better not pray, make my supplication before God, a request, because I'm anxious again, I feared again, I sinned again. He forgives those who forgive themselves, he forgives those who make the proper steps first, and no. He gives not as the world gives, but he gives freely. He gives freely to the anxious heart. Do not be afraid of the world which cannot give the peace of God. Fear God who gives a peace that surpasses understanding. In other words, go to God to be anxious about nothing. Not be anxious about nothing and then go to God. Because if it was something achieved, then what is this peace that surpasses understanding? If it actually makes sense to us. What is this unreachable peace if we can actually reach it? Or take the first steps toward it? You can't. It is not in your hand. It is in God's hand. It is given to you freely by mercy. What I hear is this. Paul is saying, don't camp your heart and mind in anxiety. My made, um, you know, depression and anxiety will pull you quick to he who holds you together. Someone's going to say, well, I'm fearful again. I'm downcast again. May that draw you to Christ. So we know, go to God in prayer with thankful hearts and make our supplications known. Well, how many times have I been so downcast or so anguish, anxious that I've pleaded with God? Just take this away. I'm tired of feeling this miserable, Lord. Please stop this anxiety. Return the joy of my salvation. And we think, well, if I just say it once, it should just be there. And I never have to return to this road again. And that's, that's not what this is about. This is a continuing going through this life. And you think, you don't believe me. You have no idea what is headed to you this week. You have no idea what is headed to you this year. Something is going to call into question into you. You're going to get anxious, downcast. Do not question the character of God. 
Do not think, well, he won't fulfill his promise. He won't listen to me. Now, I confess to you, regularly does my soul become downcast. It's a, it's a regular rep, you know, repetition. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense. Things are going well, and there I am in melancholy again. And I also confess to you that with really a, without reason or cause, my heart can race toward anxiety. And there are some little tricks here and there to help, but they're just temporary. And some of them only ends up bottling that up under, under pressure to explode at a later date. How foolish I can be when I'm that weak. How dark my thoughts can get. And I can pitch my tent in such bitter land. And Paul says, don't do that. It's sinful. Blessed are those who mourn. Not blessed are those who find tricks to stop mourning. Practical helps to, well, I'm just going to try and get over it. And maybe I'll let time pass. You know those little tricks have done nothing. It's knowing my foolishness, my brokenness towards sorrow, grief, and anxiety. I have found that Christ regularly and still visits with me and comforts me. I've learned that I'm not great. I know this uh, comes as shocking news to some of you all, but I'm not great. My pride crashes when I get in these dark times. I'm not fine sometimes. But uh, if, I, if I let such pains get the best of me, I could find myself staying there in the dark and the bitterness rather than a gentle reasonableness. And I can be warned by the, by the most gracious of words. You're not being very gentle. You're not being very reasonable. I want to be impressive. I hate that about myself. I even want to be cheered. But I found that this pulpit is not meant for my glory. And this Bible isn't meant to be taught to boast of my knowledge of it. And it's funny, they, they say that I have a master of divinity. A divinity is not something you can master. And I could, I could sit here the, the remaining time I have to just dissect the scripture and leave it here. But if I haven't drawn you to Christ, then I've failed in this sermon. Because as I reflected on this week and in, in this passage, in prayer to the Lord, my mind cleared to truly find this passage rather precious to me. I treasure this command to rejoice in the Lord always, to pray with thanksgiving that the peace of God may guard my heart, my mind in Christ Jesus. I treasure that this is written to us as a church family as a whole, that is, peace guards all our hearts and all our minds in Christ Jesus in unity. So my beloved flock, I say this. I cannot count to you how many times I've gone to the Lord to confess my pride. I cannot tell you how many times I've gone there, confess my anxiety and how anxiety has led me to more anxiety. I cannot tell you how many times I've gone to the Lord to confess that I refuse to rejoice in the Lord. But he has forgiven me. I do not have a count on the times I, with tears I've begged him to calm my anxious heart and to lift my downcast soul. And though things on earth don't always go well, there is plenty to be scared of. He has always been a faithful daily provider of strength. And there may be pains I carry with me, both physical and emotional. Yet I get daily reminders of his coming grace that strengthens my hope for each step of the journey. Sometimes it is in the warm sunshine he sends, or in the, a friend who gives me a good laugh, or even the smile of my wife and kids. You lose hope only in this world and yourself, and into a hope in Christ alone. He is God's gift of peace that surpasses understanding now and always. Through the hardest griefs and the most shattering anxieties, he listens to his children as he listens to Christ. He does not turn a deaf ear to the Son. And he gives mercy for every step forward toward our home to be with him forever. So in closing, I say this. I know that anxiety and grief will call into question in your and my sinful, corrupted heart and mind 
the character and the everlastingness of the promise of God. And you say, will he pass me by this time? And you say things like, does he love? Or does he have a limit to this? When you look at the cross, what do you see? Do you see the sufferings of a man who was simply at the hands of a bad oppressor? He did that willingly, with confidence. Why would he suffer such? Why would he go through a cross? Because he loves his church. When he says, I will not abandon you, but I, and I will not forsake you, I am with you always, even at the end of the age. What in, that, what in that promise do you hear that you can call into question his goodness? Even when life doesn't make sense, even when pains and frustrations don't have earthly answers, there, there, is, there is coming a time when all that is wrong will be righted. May we carry on with a living hope and the strength of Christ in us. Let us pray.